All right, we are going to go ahead and get started since it's 12 o'clock. Uh, welcome to Medical Grand Rounds at the University of Colorado. Thanks, everyone, for being here in person. Uh, as a little bit of a teaser for what's upcoming on February 28th, we're going to welcome our own Dr. Sarah Rowan, who is ID faculty at Denver Health. She's also the CMO for the Jefferson County Public Health uh, Department to speak about management of infectious complications uh, regarding injection drug use. And then on March 6th, we're going to welcome the 2024 Distinguished Collins Lecturer, Dr. Elaine Worcester from the University of Chicago Division of Nephrology. Um, as you know, we get CME and MOC credit for all going around, so feel free and hopefully you have hit that already. I want to also remind you this will appear in the chat. Nominations for Grand Round speakers for this coming academic year are open for two more weeks. Division heads got a reminder this past week, but for everybody else, please get your submissions in shortly. Okay, now I am very pleased to welcome today's speaker, Dr. Lavanya Kundapali. Dr. Kundapali is an Associate Professor of Medicine here at the University of Colorado in the Division of Cardiovascular Medicine. She is also the Director of the University of Colorado Cardio-Oncology Program a program that she founded and helped build since 2014. Her undergrad work was done at Harvard University where she graduated magna cum laude. Her medical school was at the Pritzker School of Medicine at the University of Chicago. She was also an intern and resident at the University of Chicago before going on to a fellowship training in cardiovascular medicine at the University of Pennsylvania, where she also completed a one-year fellowship in cardio-oncology uh, while at Penn. Dr. Kundapali is the founding director of our cardio-oncology program, as mentioned earlier. It's designed to meet the needs, the cardiovascular needs of patients with cancer and of cancer survivors. Dr. Kundapali is truly a national and international expert on this growing topic. She is someone who can do it all, uh, and her expertise spans from clinical care to research, education, on to advocacy. She, uh, in addition to her scientific work, uh, which is very well reflected in her numerous papers and numerous uh, invited talks, Dr. Kondapali also served as the Cardio-Oncology Council member for the AHA from 2019 to 2021. She's a current member of the Education Committee uh, for the International Cardio-Oncology Society, as well as the Pediatric Cardio-Oncology Working Group, the Cardio-Oncology Advocacy Working Group, the Cardio-Oncology Training Working Group, all for the American College of Cardiology. Lavanya sits on the Colorado ACC Board of Directors and as a marker of her dedication and success was named president-elect in 2023. Uh, if you're wondering what she does in her free time, I will tell you she is also a member of the UC Health Physicians and AVP Advisory Group. She is the Division of Cardiology's represent representative to the Weldom Committee. She's a trusted advisor for the Cardiology Fellows in the Division of Cardiology, and she is the secretary for our faculty senate here at the University of Colorado. It truly is a pleasure to welcome Dr. Kundapali. Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you so much. That was a very, very kind introduction. Uh, I'm so excited to be here. Thank you for the invitation. And, um, and over the course of the next 40 minutes or so, we'll talk about kind of hot topics in cardio oncology. So I have no disclosures relevant to this presentation. Uh, we already went through this. So over the course of the next 40 minutes, we're going to define cardio-oncology and describe the landscape of this burgeoning field of cardiology. Uh, through case-based discussion, we're going to review high-yield cardio-oncology topics. And then finally, we're going to highlight some of the collaborative cardio-oncology research occurring here at the University of Colorado. Uh, this is meant to be interactive and fun. There are questions embedded. Audience um, participation is always welcome. And if you have any questions along the way, please do uh, just raise a hand. Okay, so we'll start with a case. Uh, a 71-year-old female with a history of high blood pressure, diabetes, and locally advanced melanoma of the scalp. Uh, who recently completed cycle two of ipilimumab, presented to the ED with weakness and vomiting. An electrocardiogram was performed. And this is the electrocardiogram that was performed in the emergency room. She was just there because she was weak and she was having GI distress and vomiting. We'll come back, put it in your head of what you think this rhythm is, and then we'll come back to it. Okay, so first off, we'll just start by talking about the definition of the scope of cardio-oncology. So when we really think about cardio-oncology, it, it encompasses a lot. It's really the management of cardiac conditions in both patients undergoing cancer treatment and in survivors. 
And in terms of kind of how we think of it within the field of cardiology, it really is an up and coming burgeoning field. So this is just one reflection of uh, in PubMed of when did cardiotoxicity and chemotherapy really start making, um, making a splash and when do we start seeing publications about it? So in 1973, there were some original reports about heart failure with doxorubicin. And then uh, by 1998, when trastuzumab was approved in the United States, which we'll talk about, but it is a drug to treat breast cancer. After that, we really started to see a rise in people starting to publish about potential cardiac side effects of cancer therapy. So first, our first question, um, and maybe a suggestion for the future is an audience response system um, for the Department of Medicine uh, to keep it fun. So how many drugs um, has the FDA approved in hematology oncology since 2020? A, 25, B, 317, C, 109, uh, or D, 210? So maybe we'll just do like a show of hands and I'll just kind of uh, see, or if someone would like to just offer an answer. Um, any, any answers? Just someone want to take a guess? B? Okay. <laughs> okay. Close. Yeah, no, good. So you're, you're thinking already. You already kind of know uh, where I'm going with this. It's actually 317 is not it. It's actually 210. So really it's pretty remarkable, right? Like that many drugs since 2020, that's not even like four years ago. Um, so really, you know, the field of oncology is dramatically changing at a very rapid pace with so many new drugs being um, coming to market and getting FDA approval. And, um, and this just reflects, you know, the original, um, what the FDA originally approved a drug for. So many of the drugs in oncology will have uses uh, that go beyond just what their original FDA approval was. And so when we think about kind of where cardio-oncology is, um, so, you know, in terms of kind of the stats of how many Americans have heart disease, you know, in 2018, the last survey was about 30 million um, Americans uh, are in the United States with heart disease, about 23 million have cancer and really cardio oncology sits right in that yellow. So we're really in the mix between those who have heart disease and those who have cancer. Uh, and then when we turn, when we think about kind of why does it even matter? And so we really have uh, a change in the way we think, I think, about, um, about oncology from a cardiovascular standpoint. So, you know, not too long ago in the times that I was training still, unfortunately, when people got a cancer diagnosis, the thought was that their, all of their other medical problems no longer needed to be managed. And that, well, the oncologist will now just take care of all of your medical problems and we don't need to worry about your statin and we don't need to worry about you being on an aspirin or being on Plavix or taking care of um, your risk factors. Um, but the truth is, is that, uh, you know, oncology care is really changing. I'm not an oncologist. I'm just a cardiologist, but the, um, you know, not all, but some cases, a lot, a lot of oncology becomes more of a chronic medical condition. And so it's really important for us to continue to, uh, to take care of the cardiovascular health of our patients um, who have a cancer diagnosis. And unfortunately, uh, when we look at the leading cause of death in the United States for both men and women, it's still heart disease. Uh, and, and, it, and cancer is, um, I guess, you know, number two in terms of diagnoses, but heart disease is still the thing that is killing um, most Americans. And this just reflects kind of where are the oncologists? And again, I'm not an oncologist, so I am a little bit out of my scope, but you know, their survival rates are much higher than they were um, when some of us were tr even training. And so the average survival rates now for adult, uh, five-year survival rates for adults who are diagnosed with cancer is over 65%, like over, overall, um, and actually closer to 70%. And this is why it actually matters. So on the one hand, um, and this I think is one of the most important slides that I present, and if I've taught you nothing else, um, it's really just to think about this, which is that um, when we look at, this was a study that came out of uh, Kaiser Southern California, and they took all of their patients and they just looked to see who had a cancer diagnosis and then what kind of cardiovascular disease did they develop. And they wanted to just look at kind of their probability of survival um, at you know eight years. 
So when you look at the group that is most likely to be um, alive at eight years, it's those who don't have cancer and don't have not been diagnosed with cardiovascular disease. But then when you look at the next best group, um, or the most likely to be alive at eight years is actually cancer survivors who have not developed cardiovascular disease. And then when you look at the group that does uh, the, that is the third less, third likely to, um, to be alive at uh, eight years, it's those folks who don't have cancer um, but have cardiovascular disease. And, and unfortunately, the group, that, the group that has the lowest probability of survival at eight years is the cancer survivors who've developed cardiovascular disease. And so their, the cardiovascular health of our patients, um, I think, is always important, but it's actually even, even in some ways very, very important to keep in mind uh, for those who have had to go through cancer treatment. And what is also really interesting, um, but also a really an important area is actually what happens to childhood survivors. So uh, St. Jude, which is um, a cancer hospital uh, that uh, has actually done some really remarkable work at following uh, childhood survivors of cancer. And so they have like 30 years of data of just surveying patients who uh, were treated at St. Judas Children. And then they also have simultaneously been surveying um, their siblings. And what they have found is that unfortunately, compared to siblings, childhood survivors are definitely more likely to have cardiovascular disease. And so in this study, you know, just uh, looking at, for example, congestive heart failure. So compared to, uh, to compared to siblings, survivors of childhood cancer were 15, you know, had a relative risk of 15 of being more likely to have CHF. Uh, for coronary artery disease, the relative risk was 10. For cerebral vascular disease, it was nine. And so this is a particular area that uh, we really do need to pay more attention to about how do we uh, really aggressively manage cardiovascular health in, uh, in survivors of childhood cancer. And so when we think about cardio-oncology here, uh, we really do provide comprehensive cardiovascular care. So we take care of not only childhood survivors, we have um, a very active program um, uh, seeing folks who've been taken care of at Children's. And then also um, many, some of you may know or may not know that there's also a wonderful program here called TACTIC, which is run out of internal medicine, where survivors of childhood cancer um, are managed. And so we, we partner with them as well. Uh, we also take care of cardiac patients who are diagnosed with cancer because we continue to manage all of their cardiovascular health. We also then take care of patients who develop cardiovascular issues during cancer treatment. And we'll talk about some of the high yield things that can occur. And then we also then take care of survivors of adult cancer. So it's really a continuum of all the patients that fall within the lens of cardio-oncology. But the truth is, is that, you know, you don't have to be a cardio-oncologist in order to be able to take care of cardiovascular health. And so it's really important, I think, for all of us to think about how, when we're, for the patient in front of us, if they have any sort of cancer history, how do we make sure that we're doing our part to really optimize their cardiovascular risk factors, be it managing their diabetes or treating their blood pressure, making sure we check their cholesterol. There's really things for all of us to do in order to try to help this group of, of patients. So now we'll move on to patient cases, and I've picked a few that I think are high yield in terms of what uh, trainees may be seeing on their board exams, and then also what we clinically are seeing in our clinics, and then, um, and then also on the inpatient service. Okay, so we'll go back to that original case. So a 71-year-old female with a history of hypertension, diabetes, locally advanced melanoma of the scalp, who recently completed cycle two of ipilimumab, who presents to the emergency room with weakness and vomiting, and has this electrocardiogram. Now I see some cardiologists in the room. Um, uh, does anyone want to take a stab of what is this? Uh, what is this? heart rhythm. And you don't have to be a cardiologist to answer. This was a toughie. I had to, um, what's the worst thing it could be? It's a Y complex tachycardia. What's the worst? 
Yes, Camilla, you are right. This is VT. Excellent. Yes. Um, so yeah, so this is ventricular tachycardia. And the clue actually that one of the electrophysiologists gave me about why this is VT is, um, and hopefully I don't get the pointer wrong, um, is take a look at AVR. So when you think about AVR, see how it's up in AVR? So I thought this was a really good clue, which is why I wanted to share it. So when you think about where AVR is, right, it's your right, oh, oh dear. Um, it's your right arm. Oh, press the screen to wake up. Maybe I'll just, hmm. Um, let's see. Did I, I think I, um, anyway, when you think about where AVR is, thank you so much. I don't know what I did. <laughs> um, Okay, when you think about where AVR is, right? So AVR is towards your right hand. And so if you're getting a positive vector, if you're getting uh, forces that are going towards that lead, it's gotta be coming from the ventricle. So um, it's just a, a quick clue to kind of help you. Um, thank you so much, I'm sorry about that. Um, so that's a quick clue. So there's that positive vector in AVR, it's positive in AVR. So this is most likely ventricular tachycardia. Okay. Okay. Perfect. So here's some additional information. So the uh, the troponin. This is a little bit of an older case. So it was before high sensitive troponin, but this troponin is elevated at, two, at nearly three. An elevated BNP, a transaminitis with an ALT of eight forty nine and an AST of five ten, and an elevated creatinine of two and a half. This is an echo that was performed. Um, this is not her echo, um, but this is the, this is basically what her echo looked like. So this is a parasternal long axis view. And in terms of what, just to orient everybody, this is the mitral valve. Uh, this is the aortic valve. And then this is the anteroseptal wall of the LV. And this is the infralateral wall of the LV. And so this uh, has severe LV systolic dysfunction. And you, when you think about it, like I know I'm only showing you one view and those of you who have rounded with me will know that I say that you can never assess an ejection fraction with just one view because it's a, you know, a three dimensional structure that we're only grabbing in two dimensions. Um, if you were to start to visualize if every single wall of the heart is only moving this much, uh, then you can imagine that in terms of how much blood is getting ejected out when this ventricle beats, it's definitely probably like 10% or so, very severe LV dysfunction. The, uh, this woman went through an angiogram. These are her films. And so this is the right coronary artery over here. Um, there's no significant obstructive coronary artery disease. This is the left coronary artery. There's the circumflex and the LED coming out her coronaries look fine. So, you know, when people have ventricular tachycardia, uh, we always worry, are they having ischemia? The coronary, she's not having an ischemic event, her coronaries are fine. Okay, so what is the diagnosis of what is going on with this woman? Who said that? Yes, absolutely, Tim, excellent. <laughs> Um, yes, yeah, so she has she has immune checkpoint myocarditis. So she actually presented 13 days after her second cycle of ipilimumab, which is an anti CLA uh, CTLA four antibody. And so um, when we see checkpoint myocarditis, the the highest likelihood of the disease occurs within 90 days. Um, now, again, we don't have great data, but that's what the, the data suggests, that if it's going to occur, it's going to occur early. So her timing works out for checkpoint myocarditis. Um, her course was that she got high-dose steroids within six hours of presentation. So if it crosses your mind that someone could have myocarditis, the recommendation is that we start high-dose immunosuppression with IV steroids um, nearly immediately, and we usually use solumedrol. Her VT, unfortunately, was refractory to cardioversion, amio, and lidocaine. Eventually though, and I see Dr. Gill, who probably remembers this case because he's the one who took care of this woman in the, uh, in the CCU, uh, she converted to sinus rhythm and her ejection fraction improved to 55% in eight days. So she started getting treated with, you know, all of this, all of this stuff. And I forgot to mention, because she was still in VT by the next day, her immunosuppression was increased and she was given mycophenolate. And then we just had to kind of hold on. And after eight days, uh, she improved. She broke and she was in sinus. Uh, her EF had improved. 
Um, unfortunately, though, she continued to stay in the ICU and developed many complications of being on such high dose immunosuppression. She ultimately, after three days, passed of, of P. acnes bacteremia. She had DIC. She was basically multi system organ failure. And her family, um, were generous enough to agree to an autopsy. And so this is actually from her autopsy of her right ventricle. And so what you can see here is all these little blue things. I'm not a pathologist, but those are lymphocytes. Um, and that's what we'll see with checkpoint myocarditis. It's not more specific than that, unfortunately. Uh, it's just lymphocytic infiltration of both of her myocardium. And so, um, so unfortunately, uh, we diagnosed it early, but um, her course uh, did not go well, not necessarily because of the cardiac complications, but because of other complications. And this was how checkpoint myocarditis first was reported. It was these very dramatic cases. Um, but now that we have more experience with checkpoint myocarditis, we're learning that it's not all people in cardiogenic shock in the ICU, which we'll talk about. Just a word, I mean, I'm sure that many of you are very familiar with these checkpoint inhibitors. These things are changing the way that uh, oncology uh, treats many conditions and the approvals are going up and up. Uh, this is you know, the latest list I could find, but I'm sure it's not even up to date because the indications and the drugs are, are moving so fast. But the general principle behind how these checkpoint inhibitors work is that Basically, tumor cells are really smart, right? They hijack the, our native immune system uh, and they use it for our, their own purposes. So, you know, left to your own, left to its own devices, what the immune system will do, or so, I'm sorry, um, what, the, what, um, what a tumor cell will do, it will, it will hijack some of these T cell receptors like PDL1. And it will start to use, um, it, will, it, will, it will basically squash this T cells receptors ability to work on the tumor cell. What these checkpoint inhibitors do, and this is just an example, is they block where the tumor cell was interacting with the T cell. And by hijacking kind of that interaction, now this tumor cell, the T cell can work on the tumor cell to kill the tumor cell. And so it's kind of revving up someone's own immune system to try to, to, to kill cancer. This, I saw this, uh, one of the pharmacists taught me this, and I think it has been the, one of the most helpful approaches to how I think about immune checkpoint inhibitor adverse events. So the truth is, is that any organ system can be affected and have an immune response from the checkpoint inhibitor. And so if you take an organ system and you add itis, that can be an immune checkpoint adverse event. And so thyroiditis, myositis, vasculitis, my myocarditis, hepatitis, uh, dermatitis, right? It gets kind of fun after a while. But so really anything can happen. Um, and the typical uh, treatment initially is going to be steroids. Thankfully, many of these things, um, and for the oncologists in the room who have more experience than me, many of the, the side effects are often treated outpatient with, with prednisone. And so um, a few years ago, when we started thinking about how do we be more programmatic about the way we approach uh, checkpoint inhibitors, because we were having a hard time keeping up, and we kind of still do, just keeping up with how often these are being used and with all of these expanded um, indications. And so along with Dr. Groves um, and Dr. Uh, Teresa Medina, uh, who is a melanoma on uh, oncologist, and Ronnie Miller, who's one of our cancer center pharmacists at the time, we really thought, we got together and thought about what's, a, what's a, a way that we can start to try to understand this myocarditis better and make sure that we're not missing it. Um, and I will just say too, you know, when I think about which field in oncology has been using these checkpoint inhibitors the longest, it's really been melanoma. And so they were first approved in melanoma and they've been around for so long. So I really um, lean on Dr. Medina's experience with being one of the most, um, you know, the, the folks who's been dealing with these things and treated so many of these adverse events for so long. So our general approach, and this is what I do for patients that I'm seeing in, in clinic, is that for all of my patients who are going to be on checkpoint inhibitors, I generally will have a baseline BNP. I check a baseline troponin, and I, and when when possible, I also like to check a baseline CPK. 
And um, our, our general approach is that, you know, we just kind of have a baseline because when someone has a symptom um, and that symptom could be anything like new palpitations or something, the thing you always want to be weary of is, oh my gosh, could this be myocarditis? And so it's very easy for me to have them check a repeat troponin. And if that troponin is negative, it doesn't mean they're out of the woods, but it means, okay, well, your palpitations could just be that you've developed some arrhythmia, but it's not that, oh my gosh, this is myocarditis and I don't want to miss myocarditis. And so um, in general, uh, we uh, have a very low threshold to work up any new cardiac symptom. And especially if there's any, um, any myositis or symptoms of myasthenia gravis, those three things, myocarditis, myasthenia gravis, and myositis like to happen together. And so sometimes you'll have myositis and myocarditis, or you have myasthenia gravis and myocarditis. And so if any of those things are present, we have a very low threshold to look for, uh, for my, uh, checkpoint myocarditis. Um, if the po if the troponin is positive, we tend to admit these patients, and um, some of our hospitals colleagues are very skilled at management of this now because it becomes kind of an emergency. Um, but we will admit we will. Um, not sure what I'm doing, but I, I really haven't moved. Um, Anyway, so we'll admit them. We start them on um, methylprednisone. We uh, try to get them a cardiac MRI. We get them an echo. We do evaluate the coronaries to make sure that we're not missing um, missing coronary artery disease as a source of their troponin. And then uh, we have a low threshold to start them on beta block or ACE inhibitor for, um, for ejection fractions. Um, and then... Well, what we'll typically do with these patients is that after we get the initial myocarditis under control, we then actually follow them serially with twice a week troponins every week that they're on immunosuppression. And as an outpatient, if we see any rise in that troponin, that will, uh, will make us think about increasing their immunosuppression. Um, and sometimes we repeat the cardiac MRI. And what we've learned from Dr. Groves is that, yes, you can repeat a cardiac MRI too soon. And so um, we always, you know, I think that that was one of our learning curves was that we just didn't know. And so it's really been, um, it was really just collaboration between both oncology um, with cardiovascular imaging, and then also, you know, just um, with me having some knowledge about this stuff, about kind of figuring out what made the most sense. Cause we can't, we, you know, a little, how much of a troponin increase is gonna be enough that it's gonna make us react. Um, and so, because there were no strict guidelines, it was really just consensus and collaboration that helped us, um, helped us come up with this. And this, we literally have been using now for, um, I mean, I think we're going on like five years of, of this approach. And thankfully we've done, we've done well. Um, I also wanted to alert you, um, uh, I think I'm getting some help a little bit. Okay, um, that you know our landscape is also changing a little bit about how we're managing myocarditis because we just don't know what is the best way. And so right now we're currently enrolling for a study called Atrium, which is looking at a drug called Abatacept for immune checkpoint inhibitor myocarditis. So we're a, a, we are a site, um, it's both a study that's happening in the US and Canada. And it's a phase three uh, investigator initiated randomized placebo controlled trial looking at the efficacy and safety of upfront abatacept in patients who are hospitalized uh, with immune checkpoint inhibitor myocarditis. And so um, we have two wonderful uh, PRAs, Aaron um, Markham and Seth Snell, who are actively screening patients. And if any of you come across a patient that you're taking care of on the inpatient setting where it's crossed your mind that there could be myocarditis, please be in touch. We are interested in... Um, in aggressively trying to enroll uh, in the study because I think the question is really important. We just don't have the data about how to best manage the patients and we don't wanna miss it because if we miss it, we could miss, you know, unfortunately fatal arrhythmias. Uh, so we need to um, be, we, we have a pretty aggressive approach of trying to catch patients with myocarditis. In terms of kind of what the experience has been, we actually did this study a few years ago looking at compass data and so, we wanted to understand, you know, was it that, um, how could we better identify um, cardiac side effects from um, immune checkpoint inhibitor, uh, immune checkpoint inhibitors? And so part of the problem in this field is that the way drugs get, um, cancer drugs get approved is that 
of course, and it makes perfect sense, they're looking for cancer outcomes. And so I'm a cardiologist, right? We have big cardiology trials. We have hard cardiovascular outcomes like MI, stroke, um, you know, repeat hospitalization, kind of things like this. But those kinds of endpoints aren't, don't exist in, in, mo, in nearly all oncology trials. And so the, uh, what we were trying to do is think about, well, how good is the coding? Because when people are in clinical trials, they get adverse events recorded. And we wanted to see, like, is there a way that we could um, figure out the fidelity of, of ICD coding for identifying adverse cardiac events from people who've been exposed to checkpoint inhibitors? And what we found actually was that ICD coding, which you can see on the bottom here, um, you know, was really good for things like, sorry. Um, so ICD coding was really good for things like clot. It was really good for things like um, for MI. But when it came to myocarditis, um, the ICD code did not connect well with wh whether or not they truly had myocarditis and things like uh, Heart failure as well did not really, uh, we couldn't depend on the ICD coding. So one of the big issues in this field is how do we get data? How do we know that the data is good? And the way that we um, did the study was that we actually adjudicated all of the events with two cardiologists to say, was it truly an event or not? What was also really interesting is that although we worry so much about myocarditis, in 1,800 patients that have been treated with checkpoint inhibitors within our health system, uh, there were only six that had you know, truly proven, um, adjudicated by two cardiologists, myocarditis, which in the grand scheme is actually not that much, but was far more common was the things that we think of like clotting, myocardial infarction, heart failure, those um, uh, events, adjudicated events were actually much more common than myocarditis, even though the thing we worry about the most is myocarditis. Um, I wanted to show you this slide, but basically the, the truth is, is that although we, um, although we worry about myocarditis, the other things that are far more common for um, immune uh, related adverse events are arrhythmias, conduction abnormalities. That's why if someone has um, complete heart block, we always worry about it. Could it be the checkpoint inhibitor? Pericarditis, um, acute coronary syndrome. There's actually some signal that uh, immune checkpoint inhibitor therapy, they, they followed patients who had CT scans and they calculated their calcium scores. And within a year of being on immune checkpoint inhibitor, and it was a small study of only um, of less than 200 patients, they actually found that there was an increase in, their, in the burden of atherosclerosis in patients treated with checkpoint inhibitor for a year. So more to become, but you know, I think there's a lot with regards to the cardiovascular side effects of immune checkpoint inhibitors that we just don't know yet. Okay, we're gonna get on to case two. And, um, and I'll read you the question. So it's a 59 year old female, recurrent left breast cancer, hypertension, who presents for evaluation of cardiomyopathy. Um, she initially had a DCIS that was treated with surgery. She had a recurrence 10 years later that was ER positive, PR positive, HER2 new positive. And the plan was for paclitaxel trastuzumab for six cycles, followed by trastuzumab for 12 months, and then left chest radiation, and then aromatase inhibitor for five years. And here is a question. So patients at the highest risk of trastuzumab-induced cardiotoxicity include all of the following except, A, if your age is less than 50 years old, B, if you have underlying heart disease or hypertension, C, if your baseline EF is 50 to 55% or lower, or D, prior anthracycline exposure. So the question is, who is the, um, who is not at the highest risk of trastuzumab-induced cardiotoxicity? If you're young, if you've got heart disease or hypertension, if your EF is kind of low, or if you've had prior anthracyclines. Yes. Good, excellent, thank you for whoever contributed. <laughs> You're right, yes, so age. Um, so when you look at the, there's a picture of the package insert um, of trastuzumab. So this is more of a reminder because this actually does come up on, it comes up on cardiology board exams for sure. And so for the trainees, it may definitely come up on your exams as well. So trastuzumab, also known as Herceptin, um, is associated with dropping people's ejection fraction. 
And so it, um, when it was first approved, um, there was an, there was, it was noted that women were having an asymptomatic decline in their ejection fraction. And so the current treatment, um, or sorry, the current recommendation for the adjuvant setting, um, which includes usually about 12 months of, uh, trastuzumab is that women will get an echo every three months. And so just remember that, that if you're taking care of anybody uh, like that, especially for a test, um, that they get an echo every three months for that first year uh, that they're, or, I'm sorry, for the year that they're on the therapy. Um, so I wanted to show you this. So we actually did a, um, we um, thought about this uh, through the AHA a few years ago. And so we uh, did a scientific statement and I was um, thankfully, I was you know very lucky to be part of that, but we wanted to look at kind of cardiovascular disease and breast cancer and kind of where do we intersect. And unfortunately, there's a lot of shared risk factors, um, and there's even more concern that there's actually um, even more connection than we even think between cardiovascular disease and breast cancer. But some of the things that are definitely both risk factors for both are age, diet, family history, alcohol intake, being on hormone replacement therapy, obesity, physical activity, tobacco use. And so all of these things, um, you know, as we, uh, as makes a lot of sense, right, increases your, your risk of heart disease disease, but also increases your risk of breast cancer. And so even more reason that um, for all patients, we should always be thinking about their uh, cardiovascular health, but especially um, in the setting of breast cancer, it's, it's a very shared, uh, a, a shared mission that we need to be, uh, and that in caring for the cardiovascular health of patients, we are also um, either helping them um, with their survivorship from breast cancer and then also helping with prevention of breast cancer, we think. Um, and then this is a schematic, I guess the folks online can see it, but when we think about kind of how do we optimize people and their cardiovascular health, and so for this question of what do we do about um, this woman who is gonna be exposed to medications that can cause cardiomyopathy, we really just wanna be aggressive about their cardiovascular health even before they start. And so it is making sure that we're managing blood pressure appropriately. We do check cholesterol. We, um, we do talk about diet and exercise, even though they haven't even started therapy yet, uh, just to make sure that um, while they're on therapy as much as possible, they're also continuing, we're continuing to take care of their cardiovascular health. And um, I wonder, there's no way to turn this or turn this one around, right? Oh, that's what you just came up with. Yeah, because this is actually the, uh, Dr. Diamond um, knows the slide well, probably, but this is actually, um, uh, when we think about some, oh no, no, we lost that. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> what I was gonna show you next is the other high yield thing that, um, that comes up um, is that, so we, we, we talk about trastuzumab, but you know, this all started with doxorubicin. So doxorubicin is in the class of drugs known as anthracyclines. It has lots of different names. It's also known as adriamycin. But this was really where we started to think about how could, how could chemotherapy cause cardiac events. And this is kind of like the classic um, uh, study that we always think about in cardio-oncology, which is that with increasing doses of doxorubicin, unfortunately, we have an increase in cardiovascular events. And so the dose at which we really start to see a rise is around 400 milligrams per meter squares of doxorubicin. And so now most contemporary uh, cancer, uh, cancer treatment plans don't even go next to that 400. And so that's kind of the dose which we really start to see a rise. And, and when you're counseling patients, this actually is super helpful because um, there's a lot of um, fear and concern that, oh, that chemotherapy could really hurt my heart. And so um, this is actually very reassuring that most of our therapy, we never actually go near that 400 and that the vast majority of people, we think that if we have aggressive cardiovascular risk modification, both upfront and during treatment and continuing it into survivorship, that nearly, you know, 95% of people will, will do just fine. Um, and there's also lots of concern, you know, people have a lot of concern um, about, oh my gosh, something could hurt my heart. And so radiation is something that um, 
there, there has historically been a lot of concern about. And so this is one study looking at kind of how much does a cardiac to cardiac events occur uh, with increasing doses of radiation. Um, and so, you know, it's an upward slope. So for every increase in gray, there was like a 7% increase in major adverse cardiac events that occurred. But the really important thing to keep in mind about this is that this is old techniques. And so in the past, during this time period where this data comes from and where a lot of concern comes from was in the 1950s. In that time period up to 2000, the techniques were very different than we do now. Now radiation is extremely focused. The radiation oncologists are very cognizant of trying to minimize kind of the exposure uh, to the heart from radiation. And so really we think in the field that we're not gonna see these late effects of radiation moving forward. And so again, another way to reassure patients that yes, there is risk. Um, you know, there's no magic pill to you know protect your heart, but really we we do think that the risk um, of cardiotoxicity from both uh, drugs like doxorubicin and also radiation um, moving forward is going to be much less. And I hope you can see this slide. Um, <laughs> and so one of the things that we have been interested in and I've um, been lucky to be involved in is kind of thinking with Dr. Diamond and then also uh, Dr. Schreiber and Dr. Roy within our internal medicine program um, and our oncology program now is kind of thinking about breast cancer treatment in older women because some of these concerns about adriamycin, um, our hypothesis was that that was actually leading to uh, perhaps people not getting um, better therapy because Adrian Mice, and I'm kind of speaking out of place because Dr. Diamond is like the expert, but um, basically the, our concern was that was there, was, were women, older women not getting um, adriamycin uh, because of this perceived concern that they were going to have heart damage. And so um, in one study, uh, what we found looking at serum, uh, serum Medicare data was that Actually, women who received adriamycin as opposed to a chemotherapy regimen that did not include adriamycin did actually have lower um, three-year overall survival and, um, and cancer-specific um, outcomes were worse. Um, and so perhaps there was something about the adriamycin. But in another study, uh, which looked at major adverse cardiac events, uh, we actually were able to show that we didn't think it was the it was cardiac events that were the reason why the women um, who received adriamycin did worse. So I take that as a win. Um, but um, but most importantly, that you know I think that's part of what we need to do is to be uh, to build the research. We need more data um, to be guiding our decisions and to really change, um, and to keep an open mind about our preconceived notions that we may be carrying around about who can or cannot receive certain therapies. Because truly, we don't know. We need to get more data to figure that out. Okay, case three. So um, a 65-year-old female with newly diagnosed metastatic renal cell cancer and new systolic heart failure, her ejection fraction is 30 to 35%. And the question that I was asked was that, should she receive pizopidib, which is also known as Votriant, and as a tyrosine kinase inhibitor? And so... Um, We'll talk about it, but basically she had really significant hypertension with pizopinib, which is a common side effect. And um, we started her on, we used that, um, that high blood pressure to treat her ejection fraction of 30 to 35%. We got her on uh, guideline directed medical therapy. Ultimately her hypertension, despite being on max doses uh, was still so high that we had to dose, that the dose of the uh, pizopinib had to be dose reduced but ultimately she was able to continue on guideline directed medical therapy. Her blood pressure was managed enough and she had stable disease on pizopinib. And I bring all this up to tell you that sometimes we have to use the side effects of cancer therapy to our advantage in cardiology. So pizopinib is an example of a VEGF tyrosine kinase inhibitor. So if you think back to what you may have learned in the past about, um, about cancer, so one of the ways that cancer grows, like Judah Folkman's like great um, discovery, right, was that it develops its own vascular supply. And so these VEGF tyrosine kinase inhibitors work on the VEGF receptor present, present in, vascular, in the vasculature. But as we um, you know, all know that vasculature is everywhere, especially in like all of your arteries. Um, and so one of the, um, 
one of the things that we see is just all these side effects with regards to hypertension from the VEGF tyrosine kinase inhibitors. And this is just a list of some of them, but there's, again, all, always new ones coming down the pike. And so if you're seeing someone um, who is on a VEGF tyrosine kinase inhibitor um, and they develop hypertension, please be aggressive about treating that hypertension. Um, we really try to really max out therapy for hypertension before we um, talk to oncology about decreasing doses. Hypertension occurred in nearly 50% of people on um, clinical trials for these drugs. So it's real, um, but it can be treated. The other side effects that we monitor patients for on these tyrosine kinase inhibitors is both cardiomyopathy and also clotting. So there's a higher risk of both arterial and venous thromboembolism. And many of you probably already know this, but um, it still comes to me every day, which is that, you know, I probably order more vascular ultrasounds <laughs> looking for DVTs um, uh, outside of oncology because of the concern of just the kind of the increased clotting risk with a lot of these drugs. Okay, so in conclusion, did I lose it again? Um, cardio oncology focuses on optimal cardiovascular care of people receiving cancer treatment and cancer survivors. Uh, immune checkpoint inhibitors can cause an immune response in any organ system. Trastuzumab, uh, Herceptin can cause cardi cardiomyopathy, and then VEGF tyrosine kinase inhibitors can also cause hypertension. And so just to give you a little bit of kind of the flavor of what's happening here um, outside of what I've already spoken about. Uh, so what's really great is that we're at a great campus and there are many people who are doing cardio-oncology research who are, um, who are outside of the division of cardiology. So um, I just wanted to highlight, so Vanessa Patterson is one of our PhD uh, candidates at the SCAS School of Pharmacy, and she's looking at cardiovascular risk assessment um, and prescribing patterns using big data of cardiovascular medications in women with breast cancer. Um, and really exciting, she's already presented at the AHA with some of her work. Um, it's this kind of like multifaceted uh, approach that will help us start to really get data about how we should be managing um, and shepherding the cardiovascular health of our, of our patients. Um, I also wanted to highlight both Ryan Marker, um, who's one of our faculty within the physical medicine and rehabilitation uh, division, along with Julia Bass, who's one of our medicine residents. They're looking at the cardiovascular health of patients undergoing Be Fit, Be Well, which is an exercise program that happens at the Wellness Center. You know, the preconceived idea is that, oh, you've got cancer, you're on treatment, you can't exercise. But actually, we know that exercise is super, super important. And like Bill Cornwell's in the audience, right? Like everybody's got to be exercising all the time. I should be exercising right now. Um, so, but the point is, is that, um, you know, we really know it's really important, especially for, um, for folks going through cancer treatment, better quality of life, better symptom control. So we're trying to change the stigma that, oh, you've got heart disease and oh, now you've got cancer. Um, now it, you really can't exercise. No, you absolutely should. Um, and we're also looking at kind of the respiratory health of survivors of lymphoma and um, also getting them to exercise and kind of watching uh, what's happening with their uh, by taking measurements of their respiratory health. And then um, also really exciting um, is one of our postdocs um, at CU Boulder. So Zach Clayton um, is doing basic and translational work, looking at kind of vascular dysfunction of anthracycline um, chemotherapy. And so both Dr. Kamdar and I are involved. Um, he has an R01. And when he gets to the clinical phase, we're doing a translational study looking at patients that we take care of um, in our lymphoma practice uh, and, you know, looking at their vascular endothelium. So it's pretty exciting. Um, and then just to let you know, kind of in terms of our clinical team here, um, many of you probably already know these folks, but they're really, um, it's, it is a team approach. So uh, Raimundo Quintana joined us a few years ago. He's both a cardiovascular imager and does cardio-oncology. Julie Michalak is one of our most um, seasoned expert nurse practitioners in cardiology, and um, she is looking to learn new things. And so she's doing cardio-oncology. Nicole Prabhu is one of our new faculty who's interested in becoming more um, adept at cardio-oncology. And then we're nothing without Jennifer Bisbee, who's our nurse navigator, and Gracie and 
Desi who keep us moving in clinic. Um, I feel like this is the Oscars and I have definitely forgotten people and I knew that going into it. And so um, I'm sorry. So, but yes, thank you. There are so many people um, who have helped to take care of uh, these patients and uh, will continue to help take care of these patients be it uh, taking care of them in the inpatient service, on the hospitalist service, be it that you have been willing to do a procedure on one of our patients in cardio-oncology. And um, of course, every oncologist who has ever referred us a patient is just shown us that they understand that the cardiovascular health is super important of these patients. And so we appreciate it. Um, and then most importantly, our patients. So um, our patients have taught us the most. Um, that is the only way you learn anything in cardio-onc is to is by listening to the patients. Uh, so thank you all for your attention. I'm happy to take any questions anybody has. All right, we definitely have time for questions. Yeah. Uh, Lavanya, I want to apologize. I believe that is the fourth projector we've killed in 12 weeks. So that's <laughs> probably a record. Um, start with Dr. Badish. Yeah, Lavanya, that was a great talk despite the AV difficulties. <laughs> thank, thank you. you. Um, I just, I was going to ask, although radiation therapy may not be such a problem going forward, um, we still see patients uh, that have been irradiated much earlier in life, like for Hodgkin's lymphoma, for example, I follow a gentleman that received mantle irradiation and developed valvular heart disease, pulmonary hypertension, mm -hmm. hyperscoliosis, all as a result of the radiation that he received earlier in life. And I know it's difficult to do anything about that. Is it? Can you not hear me? I'm sorry. Question is, we still see folks that received a radiation therapy much earlier in life, like for Hodgkin's disease or something, you know, mantle irradiation, valvular heart disease, pulmonary hypertension, hyperstolysis, all as a result of radiation. There may not be much that we can do about that now. I don't know. Sometimes I guess they, they might be a transplant candidate, but even that could be challenging due to the radiation fibrosis. Any comments on that? Or... Uh, so thank you, Dr. Badish, for your question. So Dr. Badish astutely uh, noted that, you know, although hopefully we think the future is going to be different. We are still currently dealing with um, a lot of the late effects of radiation, and that can be definitely in the form of pulmonary hypertension, um, but then also valvular disease. And, um, and it's truly, you know, when I think about it, it's, it's about um, and when I counsel, when I think about young people who had radiation, that's where I feel like we see it the most, where we have 40 year olds who have hearts like somebody who is in their eighties. And so, um, I think part of what, um, and especially kind of this AYA group, which we think of as like 18 to 35, this is the group of patients who you, you may or may not be seeing. I mean, unfortunately, the data shows that this group of patients who were childhood survivors of cancer, that period of time is the likelihood is very high that they actually may not seek any sort of medical care. And so then what can happen is that then they come in, maybe when they're symptomatic at the age of 42, and then it, it's, it's just way far too gone, right? Their valve may be shot, their cardiomyopathy has developed, the pulmonary hypertension can't be reversed. And so... Um, I think it's important for us, you know, I think it's a real need in terms of a, a population that needs attention. But also, um, you know, I think when you're seeing folks, it's important to take a good history about their past. And so if you're ever seeing a childhood survivor of cancer, um, they, uh, they, there's a lot of psychosocial um, um, that goes with that. And so um, it, do what you can to build a rapport with them so that they continue to come see you. Try to address um, not only just the health issues, but also um, the, like, I guess, you know, also mental health, what's going on with their work, um, all of this other psychosocial things that really play into their relationship with the healthcare system. And then most importantly, if there's any history of radiation, um, they really should be getting an echo because they, they can develop valve disease at a much earlier age 
age. And the sooner we find valve disease, the sooner we can try to prevent some of these later things. And then also, even though they're only 20 and the guidelines would say they don't need a cholesterol panel, check their cholesterol. They're higher risk for having abnormal um, metabolism check them for diabetes. Um, really think about them, not as the 20 year old sitting in front of you, but because of their prior therapy and the way that um, has changed their metabolism, that they actually can be more like, you know, a 60 year old in front of you. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Thanks for the question. Anybody else? There's a lot of oncologists and cardiologists here, so I figured I don't have to ask any <laughs> questions today. Bill? Hey, that was a fantastic. I, I really enjoyed that. Uh, very informative, very well. Sorry for the presence, or, you know, the slides, but that was wonderful to listen Thanks. to. Can you, I'm curious if you could elaborate a little bit more on um, the diagnostic workup for immune checkpoint inhibitor um, and then also the treatments thereafter. Um, uh, you know, obviously in a paper, NINS, BNP, maybe yeah. an MRI. Um, you showed a slide, I believe you had said predominantly a lymphocytic myocarditis if you do a biopsy, if you go that route. I think that's what you had said. Can you just back up and just kind of walk through what your uh, preferred diagnostic algorithm is and then also uh, treatments for presumed um, ICI? Oh, yeah. Thank you, Bill, for the question. Um, yeah, so the question was, can we just take it a step back and kind of think about what is the diagnostic algorithm that you're using for uh, checkpoint myocarditis? And so um, first off, low suspicion. So if, um, if people have any new cardiac symptom, especially any sort of new arrhythmia, um, or if they have myositis, myasthenia gravis, uh, we are always checking a troponin. So that is kind of, can be the first thing that's often done in the outpatient setting. Any elevated troponin, we typically will admit them um, just because we don't want to miss something. Um, we start, uh, typically it's IV um, uh, solumedrol immediately. So as soon as we can. So, and I see um, Julia's in the audience. And so she she's very well skilled at this and should pipe in as well. But um, because as, an, as a cardiologist, I try to stay out of the immune suppression and I defer that really to both the hospitals and the oncologists who do this, um, who do the immunosuppression much more than me. Um, but we typically will do uh, solumedrol up front um, as soon as they get admitted. And then um, and keep them on telemetry. We get the cardiac MRI um, in the hospital and then um, see. We, um, and then what we do is we start following their troponins. If the troponins um, come down with just the solumedrol and then they get put on um, high dose steroids, then um, we actually, as long as the troponins are coming down, we like them to be negative um, before they leave the hospital. And then they get discharged on a ZEO monitor for two weeks to watch for VT and VF. Um, if the troponins within the hospital are still not negative, then we historically have added CELSEPT. Um, and, uh, and then we, again, try to make sure that they go down or are, come, are trending down before discharge. Now with abatacept, which is kind of the new kid on the block, along with this, um, with Jacophy, which is a raloxinib, there's there is very small studies. I mean, these are not many patients that are showing that there's benefit potentially of using these up front. And so um, every case, honestly, is taken case by case. And oftentimes when these cases come up, even if it's not a melanoma patient, uh, we will work with both the hospitalist or the inpatient service um, and then also the, the patient's um, oncologist uh, and then also Dr. Medina and, um, and then us from Cardio Onc weigh in about um, kind of wh how we what we should do in that particular case. Uh, so we have been using a Batacept more recently, um, and then uh, and then only. I mean, I think I have the first patient right now in my service where we've added raloxinib, um, and so that's it's it's not yet 
algorithmic and it's very much, um, but we're hoping that we can get more of a sense from this you know, atrium study about what we should be doing. There's even questions on dosing. I mean, we're not even sure the abatacept dose, which is one of the points of this atrium study is that um, to see what is the correct dose because some would argue that the dose is too low for the atrium study. Um, so it's very um, data free. <laughs> <laughs> so um i wanted to just commend you dr kandapali on keeping oh, your composure so and giving such a great talk oh, without yes. slides <laughs> that was incredible um that was quite a feat i just wanted for the trainees in the room i thought it would be important for you to maybe mention how you become a cardio oncologist what oh. your training looked like and and just oh. to give them an idea of that oh thank you for the question um Thank you. Yeah. So the question was, how did I become a cardio oncologist? And so, um, you know, I think the the reality of is actually that I um, I went to internal medicine residency thinking that I was gonna do like nephrology or oncology. I kind of thought about both of those, and then I actually really liked telemetry of all funny things, and I. Um, decided that I really liked cardiology and like a part of what I like about cardiology, which is why it's so hilarious that I'm a cardio oncologist is I liked that there was data. I liked that there was like, you know, it wasn't just that we did things, we did them because we had data and knew that it mattered. Um, and so I ended up going into cardiology, but I, I, I thought I was going to be an electrophysiologist. And so I, um, I went to Penn with the idea of becoming an electrophysiologist. And so at the time, Penn was like one of the best places to train in electrophysiology, uh, continues to be as well. But um, so, uh, yeah, I did two years of general cardiology training. Loved being a cardiologist, did a whole year of EP, and it actually was not a good fit. Um, and then, uh, yeah, you know, and part of it was that until I actually had catheters in my hands and was doing the procedures, I realized that I frankly didn't care if um, someone's like vein was isolated or not for, for an AFib ablation. And I felt like that was a bad thing. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, so I did a lot of soul searching, which was hard, right? Because you're, you're on a trajectory, um, you know, it's kind of like going to med school and realizing you don't want to do medicine, right? Like I was on this trajectory and going down this path and, um, and had frankly made it into one of like the best EP programs in the country. And it was not going well. And so, um, I actually, um, really funny, um, met with, um, the cardiologist who runs our, um, our uh, fellows clinic. And um, unfortunately, back then, and maybe still a little bit now, um, you know, fellows clinic, it was one cardiologist who ran the whole fellows clinic, and no one knew why he did it, because it's, it's hard to be the attending for fellows clinic. And, um, and he's like, he's like, I knew you would never be an electrophysiologist. And I was like, well, why didn't you ever tell me? And he's like, because you had to figure it out on your own. And so he had been doing cardio oncology for a long time. He's one of like the original cardio oncologists. His name is Joseph Carver. And, um, and so he's like, you know, I've always wanted a cardio oncology fellow. Why don't you think about it? And so um, I became the first cardio oncology fellow at Penn the following year. And so I ultimately did five years of cardiology fellowship training, which is a long time. Um, it makes me kind of old, but um, you know, I think ultimately, uh, you know, you, you, you never know where um, life is going to open a door for you and you will, you will always be surprised over who your mentors um, will turn out to be because they may not be the people that you think that they, that you thought they were going to be. Um, yeah, but it was, it was a good fit. <laughs> and now I work in a data-free zone <laughs> of cardio-oncology. <laughs> thank you for that question. Dr. Kernabali, thank you very much for an excellent grand round. Thank you so much. <laughs>